Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today for Sketchbook Sunday, we are going to do an oil pastel landscape. And the real-time version of this is up in Critique Club right now if you want to check it out. I'll put a link down below in the video description to Critique Club in case you want to find out more information. Every month I post a new prompt. People can upload up to two paintings for a critique from me, and you get access to dozens of long, more advanced tutorials, um, or longer and more advanced than I can post on YouTube. Um, just because, you know, YouTube algorithm doesn't seem to really like those really long tutorials. But anyway, we have a lot of fun over there and it's a really supportive group. If you would love to join us, we would love to have you. Uh, details in the video description. I'm starting off by getting that little bit of mountain range up there in the upper left hand corner. I'm using shades of gray, purple, yellow, orange, brown, just trying to get kind of like a muted, um, far away area looking there. I'm using the 48 pastels from Paul Rubens. This is the first time I'm using these oil pastels and I'm very impressed so far. They have a light and fastness ratings and pigment information on every stick, which is really unusual for an inexpensive set of pastels. I think this goes for under $40 if I'm remembering correctly. And um, the quality is really lovely. I find them very easy to work with, easy to layer. They're soft and creamy, but they do set up on the paper so you can go over them, which um, is really just really nice. I love the Sennelier pastels, but they're just almost so lipsticky that it can be difficult to layer on them. They're better for like the final details. These, I feel like you can do soup to nuts on a painting and stick with this pastel. I did use a little bit of colored pencil here and there for definition. You'll see in a bit, but um, most of it's just done with these pastels and Boy, I think they're kind of like a like a hidden gem. Um, and I'll link to those in the video description as well. I'll have a review on them after I've done a few pictures with them. Um, like if you want to wait and see. But so far, so good. I really like them. Now, for my shadows there in that grove of trees, I'm using some browns, but also some purples and violets because that's going to make that yellow pop. And I really wanted to get that in there for the deep darks. Honestly, I love to use violets in um, in my shadows and landscapes. I find they give a nice punch for your darker shadows. They don't get muddy because it's such a transparent color. So uh, there's a trick I use in even watercolor, any sort of um, landscapes. So for this kind of like rocky shore, I'm using some um, buff titanium and some brown and just kind of like scribbling and smudging them together. And this is the blocking in phase of the picture. So I'm just basically trying to cover the paper with something and then I can layer up details and textures on top later. Uh, I like to get something down as a base layer. That way I can go in and add details. And sometimes all it takes is just a little scribble of a detail and it's all you need. Um, but if you don't have a base layer underneath, I find that it just looks really kind of um, undone and like the lines look too broken. I like to have that, that smooth blended base layer. You don't have to create like that. You don't have to use pastels like that. That's how I personally enjoy using them, having that blended smooth base layer and then going over with more um, painterly textured strokes on top. It's personal preference though. You do you, I'll do me, and we'll all have a good arty time. How about that? I'm layering up some kind of like a seafoam aqua -y green color and some phthalo blue in the water area. And again, still in that blending base layer. Um, just really trying to kind of cover my ground. Oh, by the way, the paper I'm using is Canson XL pastel paper, which honestly I think is just a rebrand of the Canson Me Tints pastel paper. It feels exactly the same to me, and I can't find the XL anywhere. I happened to pick it up at a discount uh, shop called Martin's. I've never seen it sold in an art supply store before, uh, but I snagged it because it looked like the Me Tints, and the more I use it, the more I think it's just a rebrand of the Me Tints. So um, go ahead and get the Me Tints. Use the rough side though on this for your oil pastel. The smooth side's great for color pencil, but the rougher side is, is gonna give you more um, ability, to, ability to layer and hold more pastel. Now here you can see going over with some more textured strokes. Now I did blend out that back bit of mountain that we see in the corner there because it was just a little too um, contrasty and taking my attention too much. So I wanted to mute that down more than it was in the photo. And now I'm adding really textured dabby stippling strokes with various shades of yellow. I'm using a lemon yellow and then a more golden yellow for that. And you can stipple, which is basically tapping. So you get these little dots of color. Um, if you like the point uh, pointillist technique, if you like the look of that, 
like George Surratt's impressionistic work. If you like that sort of technique, give oil pastels a try because you can very easily get that look. Um, I would do still the blended base layer, but then you can stipple on top. Now this tool I'm using here is actually a silicone tipped tool. And one of the best bargains for tools like this is to go um, on Amazon and look in the nail art section or go in the craft store and look in the stamping section. And you can find sets of tools that are, that are meant for crafting or for clay that are way cheaper than getting the color shapers that are sold for um, artistic purposes. It's just because it's a larger market for those types of um, tools so they can sell them at a lower price. It's not like the art supply companies are trying to be sneaky or anything. It's just that, you know, the more, if you have more customers interested in a product, you can sell it at a lower price. Art companies have a smaller customer base, so they have to charge a little bit more to make it worth their while to bring out those products. So um, nobody's trying to pull one over on you. It's just, that's just how it, that's just how it is. Um, so if you want to save some cash, go look in the nail art section or the clay section or the stamping section for that. But I really like those tools because I can pick up just, I can, I can, if I have a broken line for like a tree trunk, like I did with the white, I can just spread it out with or smooth it out with the silicone tool. It doesn't get muddy and it carries that line a little bit. I can also work a bit of pastel back and forth a bit until it tones it down to the layer that I want. And, um, and it's just great because it's, it's tiny. You don't get the pastel over your hands and you don't get big um, clumsy smudgy marks like you will with your fingers. I like to use my fingers for the first layer, that base layer that I want really blended. But after that, it's usually a lot easier to use a silicone tool and they come in all sorts of sizes um, and they wipe clean. So it's great. You don't even have to wash a brush. Um, this one here has a flat edge and it's really great for dragging down some of that um, oh, kind of washed out shore area under the trees, the soil erosion. Um, you know, if you on the, on the edges of like creek beds and whatnot, you get that kind of um, just kind of drop off of land. That's what I'm, I'm doing there. Now, since I'm working flat, you just saw me pick up my picture. The reason I do that is because when you're working flat, a lot of times your picture is distorted. Um, you can't accurately see what you're doing. So you want to look at it straight on every now and again if you are working flat or work with a table easel or prop a couple books underneath it so you can see it a little bit more accurate of an angle. Uh, the way I'm set up for filming though, the best way for me to be able to fit everything on camera is for me to film overhead. So, um, so every once in a while I have to pick up that pad of paper and take a look at it. And you also see those stripes on the edges of my pad of paper. That is just washi tape that I'm using to um, protect the edges so I'll have an area to handle the painting or to frame it to like adhere it to a mat if I need to. Uh, so that's the only reason for that. I like a nice white border when I'm done. Now with pastel paper, it's not as robust as watercolor paper. So when you go to remove the tape, very gently heat it up with a heat tool or a hairdryer. Not too much or you're going to melt your oil pastel. Um, but you heat it up a little bit, it will make the tape a lot easier to remove because it does tend to want to tear pastel paper because pastel paper does not have the sizing that water media paper has. Now for the shadow, I am using a combination of like indigo blue, black, and um, and uh, violet because I've used those colors throughout. It might have actually been a thalo blue, not an indigo. I think it was thalo. When you mix it with the black, it looks indigo. That just gives me a nice dark value to use. I'm able to bring in the black, but I don't have the black hole effect on my painting because I'm mixing it in with other colors that I've been using. So uh, kind of keep that in mind. And uh, because your black is going to be the darkest value, your white's going to be the lightest value, or the white of your paper if you're working on white paper. Like I left the upper right hand corner because it's just such a white sky. I just left it white. Um, those are your darkest, your, um, your darkest and lightest values. So you want to make sure that you can almost save that pure black in case you need it. Um, at the end of your picture. So always blend it in with another color unless you absolutely do need that really, really strong texture. Now something that's really neat to do with a color pencil like this terracotta is I can go in and draw tree trunks. I can go in and draw the edges of uh, boulders and rocks and draw cracks and rocks and all that stuff. I can draw highlights with a white pencil. Now a lot of the time it does not deposit any color, but what it does do is it scratches back through previous layers and you end up with this very vibrant, interesting line because you're you're making the line with a pencil, but only bits of the pencil is adhering. So what you're getting is this scratch back, almost like scratch art to the previous layers. And then you'll have little bits of green and yellow and purple and stuff showing up in that line. And it's just kind of energetic and exciting to, um, 
to have in your artwork. So uh, don't be afraid to go ahead and grab those other tools and use them with the uh, the products together. Oil-based and oil-based. Wax and oil, they're going to be compatible. They're going to work well together. You're not going to have an issue with uh, compatibility. So, um, so have fun. I wouldn't go in and add like a watercolor pencil or add acrylic paint on top of this because it would just flake off because the oil pastel is going to be a, um, a waxy layer. It's not going to want to let it adhere and it could still shift. It's a movable layer. Pastel is still movable. Now, here is where things go a little astray. Um, I've got these two big boulders down on the front uh, corners of my picture and I decided to work on the smaller one first to kind of practice before I go into the, you know, the all the marbles there on the other side where I got this really big kind of focal point rock. And you know me and I love painting my rocks. So I figure I would just kind of um, practice with this one and then, you know, put all my creative juju into the other rock. Uh, but you're going to see that things do not go as planned in this. And in fact, I think that I I spend more time trying to correct a mistake that I'm about to make than I did probably painting the entire painting. Well, maybe not. This painting took about an hour and a half. So had I not made the big mistake you're going to see shortly, um, I probably would have finished this in like an hour. But say la vie, that's how it goes, right? You either succeed or you learn with art. You either, you know, do it perfectly on the first try and you have a smashing success of a painting or you, um, wreck it, you ruin it, you hit the hot mess stage, you recover, maybe you don't, but you learn a lot. So I figure every painting is a success in that term with either you either come up with a great painting on the first try and you succeed in that method or you make a whopping mess and you learn how to recover from it and you learn a bunch of tools and tricks along the way. Now I wish I stopped here. Isn't that a pretty rock? I think that's a lovely rock. That rock would be just fine and dandy, wouldn't it? Oh, adding some purple, that looks fine too. You know, I at this point I'm really I'm really excited about this. I had been fighting with Art Block this whole month, the whole month of November. I had such a productive month of October doing my figure drawing challenge in November. I started to get real busy with holiday um, freelance work and yeah, I found I found a struggle. I was really struggling with the creativity. I'm still struggling with the creativity. And um and probably had I been in a better frame of mind, I would have worked on this rock and I would have said, you know, I really don't need to add anything else to this. This is fine as it is. But um, maybe I wasn't feeling confident in my own ideas and I was thinking, no, I gotta put that tree there because that tree's in the reference photo. I've gotta put it, I've gotta put a tree there. I've gotta have something else. It's not enough on its own. It's not enough. Those are like the, the words that plague us as artists. We feel like our work's not enough or we're not enough or anything we possibly create cannot be enough. And uh, so then we doubt ourselves and and uh, we try, well, we should always try different things. But so I thought, well, I'm going to put one of these white bark, white barked trees in the front, kind of like what I have far away. And that will give some scale. And, um, and I'm hating this. I'm really hating it while I'm doing it. Of course, now looking back, I'm thinking, well, you know, I could have stopped here. That wouldn't have been so bad. And so now I'm doubling down and adding some purple next to the yellow to try to, uh, break it away from the tree trunks a little bit, uh, the, the rock a little bit and make it stand out. And it's, oh, still not, still not looking good. And uh, then I decide, well, you know what? I'm just gonna I'm gonna scrape it away. I'm gonna scrape it off. I got a palette knife here. I'm gonna scrape away the tree and see if I can get back to the rock that I knew and loved oh so few minutes ago. Um, so I scraped it off. You could see obviously the paper is stained from the different layers of color. That's how that's how oil pastels go. Like you can make your own scratch art actually. Um, so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna base in some more colors and try to reclaim the rock. And that's what I'm doing here. And for whatever reason, it's just not really working. Um, I'm adding in the colors, but I'm not adding the same colors I started with. I think I was thrown off by seeing the colors underneath, thinking they were gonna be dominant as I blended these other colors into them, but really it was just a paper stain. It wasn't enough media there to, to blend into, but I'm trying. <laughs> I'm adding a little more black, trying to get, trying to break it away from the background. Cause I'm looking, the values are so off the, um, the rock really should be darker in value. And, um, and it's also cooler in tone. However, if I make it too cool in tone, it's gonna push back and not advance because I have all those really bright trees back there that are gonna compete with it. So I decided I'm gonna go back to the tree idea because I had a branch that was sticking out beyond the rock and there's no way I could get that back without redoing the water. And I really, um, I really didn't want to do that, so um, so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna try another tree here. This time we'll do a brown branch because that it must have been those white branches <laughs> that made it so wrong. And you're gonna see the brown branches really are not any better, but uh, but onward as they say. And uh, so I decided to instead of having a branch or a tree coming off from the edge of the the paper beyond what the viewer can see and kind of growing 
out from there, I decided that I would make a bush kind of growing from a crack in the rock because that happens a lot. You'll see like um, in streams and stuff, you'll see where the soil has kind of gathered and a little sapling somehow manages to grow in the cracks of these rocks in the middle of streams. It happens all the time um, that, I, that I observe. And so I think I'm going to do that. And boy, that's just such a, it's just such a letdown, isn't it? It's just this, this like lame, funky, boring little shrub growing out of my once majestic majestic rock that I so regret <laughs> putting a tree over. I wish I left the rock just as it is. Maybe I could have put a bird on it. That's another crutch. You put a bird on it. You know, if it's not working out, you know, put a bird. So here's where I double down again. And I'm like, well, let me tell you, I'm going to turn this oil pastel into paint. And then I'm going to paint on some leaves because, you know, if you run out of bullets, you just throw the gun at the painting, right? So I've added some Gamzol to my oil pastels on this palette, trying to make some like pasty paint that I can dab on. And it's still not like, it's not standing up on there. It's not like, um, it's not popping. It's just not, it's just not, it's just not friends. It isn't. There's no argument there. So I grab some oil paint and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna mix some oil paint here. I'm gonna dab in some brighter yellowy green leaves. That'll spark, it'll spark something, not spark and joy, I'll tell you that, but it will spark something and hopefully uh, break apart from the rock a bit and look like its own thing and look like it's supposed to be there and not some poorly, poor decision that I made towards the end of my painting. So I've doubled down. I am, uh, I decided to paint the branches a little bit darker and then I thought, um, Add, add a little bit of yellow to the leaves. Maybe that will help them just kind of uh, just break away from that rock a bit because it just looks so flat and awful. I'm so frustrated at this point. And then I grabbed a finer brush and it's like, well, maybe I just need some different scale and I'll put some skinnier little branches, little bushes growing up from both corners because why not? Because what do I have to lose, friends? What? Sometimes that's just what you do. At the end of a painting, you're just like, you're like, I don't know. I don't know what else I can do, guys. I'm just going to put some little branches in there and call it a day. And honestly, that's what I did. So in a couple seconds here, you're going to see the finished painting it's okay. I'm a little frustrated that I didn't quit at the before I put the tree in there, but what are you going to do? That's just how art goes sometimes. So if you'd like to see the real-time version of this, see the struggle, see it all, and glorious real-time high definition, you can find that in Critique Club. Link down below as well as the supplies that I used today. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please give me a thumbs up before you go. Until next time, happy crafting!